Another gorgeous day in Qatar, the capital city looking beautiful this morning. The mm. dust has cleared, although the confusion over project to restart has not. <laughs> well, you, you're the one I rely on to clear all this. Well, I can't, I can't help you because there is movement. Or those clubs that were described as rebels, mm -hmm. it turns out, were correct because mm -hmm. now it has been agreed by government that uh, there's the back page I'm, I'm looking at of the Daily Mail here, the inevitable headline, it's coming home. How creative. Uh, <laughs> top flight clubs are set to finish the season at their own grounds. Or are they? The government has agreed to further consultation. Mm -hmm. The rebels have forced the issue. I think quite What's the number quite now correctly. then? How many rebels have we I got think now? There are still, I think there are still about 12 that have a different view as to government suggestions right. of playing in empty stadiums that are neutral. So more than half the league mm. want their own grounds. Jens Lehmann, I mean, I only go through these, Andy, as I've picked them out mm. during my read. They're not in any particular constructed order. Jens Lehmann, man up, the headline here, lay man up. I've had coronavirus, he says. It's not a problem. Get on with it. Well, I think you I would can, probably I, concur. No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't be that much bravado. He might have had it and he might think it wasn't a problem to him, but there's... 250,000 people around oh, the world right. where it has been a big problem too. Yes. That's, that's the worry. Mirror follow-up on yesterday's story in the Telegraph, I think it was, of, of, of the suggestion Guardiola might might fancy another crack at the uh, Camp Nou, but as I said yesterday, not while Messi's Do you not think they've, not they've smooth, him and Messi have smoothed it over since he I, left? No, I don't think so. You don't? No. Why would they? Why, I, I, why I, wouldn't I, he make a call and say, listen, Lionel, come on? I, no? I would, no, I think not after the way things ended. Okay. No. Time sometimes is a great thing. Yeah, I know, can be. But uh, lovely piece in the Times today, uh, Matt Dickinson been talking with General Caviali, uh, who has twice now beaten cancer. He oh, says yeah. uh, he's feeling good again, good. but he says, uh, I am still very scared. I understand that as That's well. That's true, yeah. Uh, the Premier League must prepare for a fatality, says a health expert. Are we prepared to lose one of our own? It's okay being bold and going mm -hmm. back to work. Um, this particular gentleman is Andy if I can find his name here uh, oh it's Michael Michael Doog uh, FIFA's medical right. chair uh, has described the fight between health and economic values as mm -hmm. football goes back to work Gilberto Bonbellier a professor at Loughborough University specializes in health and risk analysis says mm -hmm. you have to be really tough on this trade-off between health and mm -hmm. other benefits uh, because we have to prepare ourselves for the inevitable we could lose somebody do you still think do you still think though that everybody's is everyone's eyes are towards Germany this weekend Absolutely. I think they are. I, I think... No question. Honestly, Richard, I, I, I just believe that, let's say, and I hope it doesn't happen, but let's say in the next two weeks, while well, German football kicks off before anyone else, there's 30 reported cases, 50 reported new cases in Bundesliga, the top Bundesliga uh, league. You stop. What would happen? You stop. And the rest would stop. You have to, to stop. The rest would have to stop, I think wouldn't they? You have to stop. That's what I'm saying. I think it's too, you know my view on this. Um, uh, Andros Townsend's dad, Troy, that we've spoken to many mm -hmm. times on Keys mm -hmm. and Grey, he has uh, articulated his fears over Barmy footballers, naturally enough. Yeah. Um, as we've said previously, four times more likely to contract it. Um, a police chief who's uh, the, the top bobby when it comes to uh, football in the UK has warned that it is inconceivable to think that supporters will not flock to matches at home grounds. Uh, Derek, uh, David, rather, Jameson of the West Midlands Police uh, told The Telegraph yesterday that restarting is fraught with hazards. Mm -hmm. That's the police. Um, the EFL, according to The Telegraph, are facing a threat of no promotion to the Premier League if they don't play on. I thought they were talking about that. If there's going to be relegation if we don't play on, which we think that's happening now, yeah? After yesterday, the after suggestion. this meeting, the yes. suggestion has been if, and it's an if still, mm -hmm. we can't play on, but there will be teams relegated. So if we're going to relegate three teams, why can't we promote three if they don't finish? Uh, because that's under, the same, that's under the same laws. Too simple and too sensible. Oh, right. So okay. we, we need to confuse okay. it. <laughs> a hint of a glimmer of common sense beginning to settle regarding the Saudi uh, takeover of Newcastle United. Uh, this from the British newspaper, I, I, I won't name because I don't mm -hmm. like it, but um, <laughs> you, can, you can guess which one I know which from. one you're talking about. It's by uh, Duncan Wright, Ash Cloud, the headline, Newcastle's 300 million Saudi takeover is causing growing unrest among rival Premier League clubs. They report here 10 clubs, not before time, 10 clubs have said, whoa, 
hold on, the piracy mm -hmm. that's been going on in that part of the world is something that we are beginning to wake up to after mm -hmm. three years, and we all need to be concerned about mm -hmm. because, as I've said time and again, going forward, if sports rights are not protected once you've bought them, if they can They're be worthless. pirated by anybody, they are worthless. Worthless. And it's, it is the train coming down the line. And I mm. said yesterday, I guarantee you somebody soon, one of the big broadcasters, and that's us, one of, mm -hmm. will soon put down sports rights. We've done it with the F1 here in this part of the world. Correct. But it'll happen in football. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely certain about that. Uh, and just to confuse things in London, um, that the, the mayor, Sadiq Khan, has said no to football at Arsenal, Chelsea, Tottenham and West Ham. We're not having football in the capital city just yet. Can he you says. do that? Uh, he can. Sure. Yes. Above um, the he's Prime a Liverpool Minister. fan. Above the Prime Minister. Uh, he's a Liverpool fan. Uh, the, the, uh, his spokesman goes on to say, as a Liverpool fan, Sadiq, of course, wants the Premier League to return, but it can only happen when it is safe to do so, and it cannot take place and put extra burden on the NHS Correct. and the emergency services. Those two things he says are absolutely right. Mm. So if, it's, if, uh, if they then regard that it's, it's as safe as it can possibly be, are you happy? And the players say, collectively, yes. And everything else is in line, and we're not impinging on the NHS, we're not taking away from them and frontline workers, then Sadiq Khan, I think, will just have to allow them to play at, at these football grounds. Now, we, we, we were first. Um, we have been replicated in, in, in uh, the, the, um, the, the show that uh, we sit here to, to do on a daily basis, Andy, by others, and, and I'm, I'm flattered that that is the case. <laughs> uh, but in our never-ending search to bring a variety <clears throat> of football people uh, to you. Um, <coughs> our next guest I will introduce. Are we struggling today? Uh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> so, let, let me ask you a question. When you were a lad, yes, and you picked teams yes. in the playground, yes. we, I'd say, I, I it won't come as any surprise to you to learn, I was always in charge. Oh, there's a surprise. Yeah, so ah, I was always picking surprise, the team. Yeah. And I always felt sorry for the last kid, yeah. who was perhaps a little, physically a little larger than the rest of us. Um, that's, that's... So he would, t he would tend to be put in goal. And then there was the kid with the glasses, um, who had asthma. These mm -hmm. days, of course, if you've got asthma, you can win the Tour de France and, and any number of uh, uh, races on <laughs> yeah, the athletic track. So you get a TUE. And, right. um, but, but when I was at school, the asthma kids used to stay on the side. They would get they? exempt, yeah. Yeah. So, so that kid was the referee. Yes. yes. I, I don't know if ever he grew up from that point then wanting to be. But I've never met anybody that did. Have you? No, certainly not anyone who was born in a footballing hotbed. No. Like, like Glasgow. Or Newcastle. Football. Newcastle is a great example. Yes. What kid in Newcastle would ever grow up and think to himself when he's seven or eight, I want to be a ref? Mark Tattenberg. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Good to see you. <laughs> when did when did it yeah. start, Mark? When did you decide actually? Yes, I think I want to be a referee. It was the good old school teacher around about fourteen when he said I wasn't good enough to play football. <laughs> I wanted. To play. I think I think it's everybody's dream, isn't it? As a, as a child that wants to play football, you, I wanted to play for Newcastle United. It's everybody's dream, but I knew I wasn't going to do it. When I got an opportunity to referee and think, you know what, I could actually do something as a referee and, hey, come on, after all the years I've had, I've been to some amazing cities, I've been to some amazing grounds. As a player, I probably wouldn't have done that. So if if there's a choice now, and, and this is what I hope that I've been able to do with some young people who can't eventually play football at the highest level, why not try refereeing? Because, hey, the rewards are so big, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of downsides with social media and the abuse that you get, but there's so much rewards. Uh, nobody used to want to be a goalkeeper. I've just made that point. Yeah. But but children these days do the gloves and the the, yeah, the, yeah. the kit and everything else. And they do Every, want to be a so, referee because when yes. I played, when I was playing, and, and and guys like Mark were refereeing, you you they weren't personalities per se. Whether they came and they ref the game, and you used to say ref was good today, never noticed them. Yeah. Now they're a huge part of the game. Mm. They are personalities in their own right. Whether that's right or wrong, well, they are, and that's what Mark's, that's what that profession has become, Mark, isn't it? Of course, but, you know, if you've seen how the Premier League and news guys have, the Premier League's evolved so much now and it's, it's a massive entertainment business. When it first started, it was, you know, the, the, the football it was, but now the money that's involved is so big. The referees have got a huge part to play in the entertainment business. And if the entertainment's exciting, people want to buy it. If it's not, and the, and the, goal, the games are 0-0 zero, zero and they're boring, and the referees are killing the game by whistling every five seconds, <laughs> then the product's damaged and hey the referees have got a huge part to play and it's everybody's excitement and this is what we're all missing at the moment with this lockdown forgive me mark we're used to seeing you um we're not very often uh, have heard from you mm. um proper geordie aren't you 
Yeah, wait, I am. It's always, I remember when I went abroad for the first time, people didn't understand us. It? I remember <laughs> having a meeting before a Champions League match and I said, guys, if there's any questions that you would like to answer after the, the, the safety meeting? And both teams put their hands up and I said, what's the problem? They said, we didn't understand one word of English. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love it. But it, you, you, you have been and you have taken charge of, was it 2016 you did the hat-trick? FA Cup, Champions League, Euros? Yeah, but forget about the FA Cup because I had a bit of a nightmare, but Champions League I, and I Europe. didn't like to say that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you were a Palace fan, Hold on, let's, let's not forget about the FA Cup. How do you judge whether you've had a good or bad game then? Um, we certainly, when I went up on my medal and I was getting booed off both sets of supporters, that normally geared with that. <laughs> <laughs> Normally you get one team's happy and the other one's upset. Four teams upset. And you know, no, I just knew that from the first few five minutes. I, and people don't understand this. And I, I suppose it's a bit like a player. You want to get on the ball early. You want to, yeah. you want to feel, especially in big matches. And I probably wanted to get the whistle out. I wanted to not stamp me authority, but you just wanted to get in the feeling. And I blew me whistle on Connor Wickham and Ahmed. Everybody that knows me as a person knows I love to play advantage. I've played some stupid advantages that led to amazing goals in the Premier League. I just don't know why I went early when we whistled, probably to get the feeling and it spoiled an, an, an attack for Palace. Would he have scored? Hindsight's a great thing because everybody stopped, but it did deny Crystal Palace a chance to, to break. But what people do forget in that situation is I cautioned Chris Smallin on the back of it. And then he gets sent off later on, and I still get blamed, even though Man United were down to 10 men. <laughs> I used to referee, you... referee always does that. Yeah. If they pull something back, they should have let go. Someone's got to go in the book, haven't they? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's one of them where it was such a promising attack anyways. And I know what you're saying, but in general, it was so blatant. It was a foul. He was breaking on the left-hand side. It wasn't a denial of a goal no scoring opportunity because it was loads. So it was defenders covering who did stop, goalkeeper stop. But... It was definitely a caution, but I would love to play the band. If I played the advantage, Richard, I probably wouldn't have cautioned him because what if I stopped? I yeah. haven't stopped the attack. I probably, yeah. especially early in the cup final, I probably would have given him a warning. How, how does a ref get himself through that then, Mark, early on? Let's say Conor Wickham has a chance and he misses it early on. He can get himself through that by working hard and getting another chance and taking that. How does a referee work his way through if you think, well, oh, I haven't started well? Uh, that's the hardest bit because... As a player, you can miss two open goals and yeah. score happy and you're a hero. If you're a referee and you make one mistake or two mistakes in a game of, you know, maybe 30, 300, 400 decisions, you're always going to be remembered. Psychology, psychologists always were there to help you. I suppose when you've made a mistake, you've got to forget about it because you, you need to move on. That's, that's mm. life. And you, you analyse more afterwards and that's probably the hardest, the hardest time is the reflection afterwards. Yeah. Because players normally either jump on an aeroplane or, or, or go on a bus with their teammates and they've got their teammates to console them. As a referee, it's a lonely world because you're driving home on your own, going through probably the match. And, um, and especially the FA Cup was so close to the Champions League. I've had two days of not speaking to anyone, beating <laughs> yourself up. But then you've, got, then you've got to concentrate on your next one. And that's when you're in top level sport, you have to move on as quick as possible because the next one's coming around. I think you were right first time, Mark. Players do get on the plane. And uh, you, yeah. you, you made the point very eloquently. You get in the car. Do yeah. you listen to the radio? Do you listen to the phone-ins post-match? But it, it, it's, human, it's, human, it's a human way. When you, when you think you've done well, you want to put the radio on because you want to hear the good bits. <laughs> or you, have the music, you want to play the music. <laughs> do you know what, Mark? When you were 14, 15 then, you decided you wanted to become a referee. When we were growing up, you obviously had heroes at, at Newcastle watching the Newcastle football team play. We've had our heroes. I'm not, a, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I'm not, are, are you a Newcastle fan, Mark? I'm thinking for some reason you're a Middlesbrough man, or is that... No, no that was... Uh, no, that don't was, be silly. Jeff Winter was Middlesbrough. That was Jeff that Winter, was, yeah. No, you couldn't be born, born all, in all Newcastle. I'll say, Richard, all I'll say on this one is I'm not a Sunderland fan, I don't, and I don't like Sunderland. <laughs> that's how you support. <laughs> no, but did you, did you have a refereeing hero? Somebody uh, you admired when you were a kid? No, because... When I, it was bizarre because, yeah, I love Newcastle, I always did. You, yeah. you had your Chris Waddles. When my dad eventually took us to St. James's and then the club evolved under the Keegan, the Keegan era. But what I used to do was I used to end up watching a lot of refereeing, you know, because I wanted to improve. I wanted to be, you know, the next. Yeah. 
referee you can move up the different levels and I, I ended up trying to watch the referee more than the players but you know one of my biggest heroes in, in, in my modern day was certainly Alan Shearer and I was lucky enough um, to referee his testimonial in his last game in St James's oh really which he got a penalty he got a penalty, did he? Oh, there's a surprise. If Alan was on the pitch, he generally got a penalty. <laughs> yes, yes, he did. No change there then. Why, why not in his testimonial? But why did you leave us, Mark? You seem to be right at the peak of your profession and you walked away from the Premier League. Why, why did you do that? But there's two things, and I'll, and I'll go to the second one because it's family related. But the first one was it's hard motivation. I've, I've done 13 years in the Premier League, and this is something that you know, when you when you push yourself so much in 2015 and 2016, because 2016 didn't just happen. Um, I worked hard in 2015 at fitness levels. I ended up understanding football more, and that was through Pierre Luigi Colina. He made us understand refereeing more. And what he means by that, what what I mean by that was he made us understand players' tactics, team tactics. So not that I was prejudging anybody, but it was allowing us to solve things on the pitch before it actually happened. And, one of the one of the moments that happened, I think it was five years ago, yesterday was a referee Bayern Munich against Barcelona and he was showing us tactics that Bayern Munich were using against the small players of Barcelona when they were when they were defending set pieces. So what they were doing was they were making blocks. And the only player that was tall at Barcelona was PK. So what they were doing was blocking PK in so he couldn't get a chance to meet the ball. And people like Muller and Lewandowski were going up against Mascarano or Alba, the small players which was giving them tra- practically free headers. So little tactics like that, when I went to come in referee the second leg, I solved it very quickly without even anybody knowing. No pundits would have known that I'd give a simple free kick and people were talking about the wonderful game it was. Nobody talked about the free kick, but that free kick solved the whole match for me because then players went, hold on, Mark understands football. He's not just a referee. He actually starts to understand what's in our head. And I think once you've got into players understanding I've become a better referee and I found the motivation levels after I did the three wonderful finals what do I need what could I do I knew I could go to the World Cup final but couldn't referee the World Cup final because no referee in the world has ever done everything so therefore probably the World Cup wouldn't have happened England hindsight's a great thing England done wonderfully well so that would have reduced my chances so I had very little to go for and then Premier League I'd done 13 years, what do I want to do? Another 10 years of Premier League. So I was given an opportunity with Saudi Arabia. You know, the second part of your question is, I had to look at my family. You know, I've got to look at my future. Refereeing, you know, it's, it, it's a wonderful life. Um, compare salaries in football, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small amount. Compare that to doctors and, and people in the UK. It's a, it's, a great, it's a great job, but it's not a long-term job. So therefore, I have to look at my future and have to secure my family's future in the long run. And that's what Saudi Arabia and, and China and, and other opportunities have allowed us to do. Because when you're in the Premier League, you weren't allowed to do anything but referee in the Premier League. Do you miss it now when you think back? you miss it? How much? Well, there's two sides of it. When I watch some games back, because at the moment with the coronavirus, we're watching repeat games. And mm. when I watch them and repeat... You, what's interesting is a lot of European performances are different, I'm refereeing different, maybe the players are different because they're not seen us on a regular basis. Clubs aren't seen you on a regular basis. I would referee Man United maybe 15 times a season, 10, between 10 and 15 times a season. So I'm going to upset them, where when you did Real Madrid or <laughs> Barcelona or Bayern Munich, you very rare upset them because you may be re- refereeing them once or twice. And English, the Premier League I've never missed. And when I watch me the Premier League games back, all I'm getting... There's abuse on Twitter and, you know, Ian Wright's raised something <laughs> huge this week about the racism side of it. Some of the tweets I had this week were a disgrace and it's from young people in society. And, you know, all, all we're trying to do is do our best to the end to the people and people don't, you know, don't appreciate that. And that's what I don't miss. I don't miss that side of the Premier League. No, no I understand that, Mark. I mean... I was when I first went on Twitter. I was a great advocate of it being useful and a useful way to communicate. But unfortunately, it has descended into the cesspit, and, yeah. and it's a real shame. Um, it I still use it because it's it's a, it is a way of, of getting a message out there if you want to. But two two things that fascinated me there. One, you said I learned the game. So when we say 
Uh, these referees know the laws of the game, they but don't they don't the know game. the game. Mm -hmm. We are wrong in some cases. But t tell me, um, I, I have had conversations with referees that said they were scared to fall out with Alex Ferguson because they knew if they did, <laughs> they wouldn't get a game at Old Trafford for between <laughs> three and six months. Did you ever go to Old Trafford with that attitude? <laughs> the first time I went to Old Trafford, I was on the, I was probably on their good sign because I was on the halfway line when Mendes hit that wonderful shot and Roy Carroll scooped it back. So I know. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> oh no! There was looking back at Alex. He was such a, a great character. Did he? Did he put pressure on referees? I think he did. I think all. I think all managers did in yeah. certain ways. I think, you know, I can remember going into Manchester City's training ground and you could see on their tactics board about the referee, who they had that weekend. So <laughs> the, the, they're looking at referees, how they how they perform, because it's all about the three points. And, you know, Salix Ferguson would have used some of his players to, to, to get into the referees here to put pressure on them, 70,000 people. I never found that an issue. I, I, I had a good relationship with him. And, you know, even the relationship, it went a little bit, um, not sour, but he, he got angry one weekend when I refereed the Manchester derby. And I remember they were getting beat 3 one sent off Johnny Evans. And it was the Balotelli derby. And, you know, Man City actually dominated him. And I remember he wanted added on time. And for, for once, Alex Ferguson didn't want much added on time, which was bizarre. <laughs> normally, normally, Alex wanted the time. Yeah, yeah. I remember, I, I was remember thinking in my head, it's payback time. So we put up, I think, about five minutes. Mike Dean, poor Mike Dean, is the fourth issue. He was shaking. Puts five. Minutes, <laughs> the score ended up six one, and he, he didn't speak to us for a little while. <laughs> Did he ever threaten to take you off at half time? <laughs> Very I, wish, I tell you what, I wish referees could be subbed. <laughs> What do you think, just well, we've, we've not got much time, but the life of a referee since you left has, and I didn't want to mention it, but I think I have to just ask, do you think VAR has made the life of a referee easier, Mark, or has it made it more complicated? It's made it easier for what? Completely easier because the referee's not making the final decision in the Premier League. Well, well you should be. Of course he is, he's the final decision maker, but the Premier League decided that and, I, and I'm not sure it's PJ Well in this. I don't think it's Mike Riley. I think the clubs are demanding that they, they don't want the game interrupted and the product interrupted. So therefore, they don't want the referees to go to the, the pitch side monitor. Well, don't have VAR is, then. <laughs> which, which in some cases, you're right, Richard, but in some cases, it's quicker to go to the, the pitch screen than wait, wait for, the, for the monitor. I just yeah. think, at the moment, till the referees start making the final decision and take ownership of the decision that they've made on mm -hmm. the pitch, we're yeah. going to have we're going to have issues. We're going to have massive inconsistencies. But the VAR is here to stay. For me, yes. it's a wonderful tool. It's a wonderful tool. We, we, we need to understand that unquestionable decisions where we're debating them, like we do on on live shows like yourselves. Therefore, it stays as the debate. We shouldn't be talking about VAR. We only should be talking about VAR when we have an absolute scandal or a clear yeah. penalty or a clear decision where the VAR is not recommending the referee to go to the screen because. If you go to the screen, and I, I went in China maybe 10 times last season, and it's much better as a referee to feel, once I've looked at the pitch side monitor, I can then move away from that decision. So, mm. like I did in the FA Cup final, it's hard to move on from a mistake, but at least when you've seen it a second time in the cold light of day on a screen, as a referee, you can move on. I, thought, somebody, I, yes, I, 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 I couldn't agree more, Mark. I think it's really, really important. But as, as an aside, do you think our referees... Uh, for want of a better word, will bottle making big decisions because they know there's a second element down the line and it, 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 it could be picked up a monstrous error. I wouldn't say bottle it, probably, you know, that's a pretty a tough word to say. Maybe for referees, it, it, we wouldn't accept a bottle decision. I think referees are going to make a decision if they're not 100% sure. In the past, without technology, top referees would probably look at a decision and go, well, I'm 80%, I'm 80% sure. So therefore, they would take their judgment, they would take their feeling and give the decision penalty. Now, if I've got a slight doubt, I can rely on the video. But the problem is, last season, because they weren't going to the, the pitch side monitor, if you had a feeling of 80%, they're, they're not giving it. And if the VAR thinks, well, it's not a clear and obvious error, it's then compounded by an incorrect error. Yeah. So mm -hmm. unless the referees are going to the screen, the 80% feeling decisions that they would give 
in the past, they're not given now, and that's just human. Yeah. Mark, this is all passed far too quickly as far yes. as I'm concerned. Would love to do it again. Can't, I, I say this every day to our guests. Really can't thank you enough for, for, for spending time with Andy and myself. It's been an absolute treat both to see, and we've done that many times down the years, but mm. as I said earlier, to hear uh, our favourite Geordie, I think he's become. Oh, I, 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 way above Shearer. Yeah, champion canny lad. Champion That's all lad, champion. Yeah. Mind how <laughs> you're gunning. Thank you, keep safe. <laughs> you too, thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Mark Clattenburg, what a nice guy. Top class. I take it all back. Uh, me too. I don't know what time. I said, but I, I must have done. I, I must have battered them yeah. many times down the years, and, and I, I take it all back now. I must have done. I must have done. <laughs> right, that's it. Again, uh, we will be back here tomorrow ahead of uh, Germany's big kickoff this weekend. Mm -hmm. We will be speaking to, I think, our, well, our favourite German. Could we describe him that way as we've just done with Mark? Oh, there's, there's a few. Remember Ruby Rusler? You like him? Oh, we do not give him. Yeah, Rusler, yeah. so yeah. it's not him. One of. Our favourite German. Yes. Now, Uwe's he's preparing he's his team to play. I, I, I'm track Frankfurt, is he now? Yeah, Uwe? I think he's there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And uh, Wagner is preparing his team to play, isn't yes. it? He was at Tuddersfield, Yes, he? so we do have some interest. Those games, mm -hmm. incidentally, will be live with us on Being Sports in the Middle East and North mm -hmm. Africa. This programme back here tomorrow at the same time you found us today. And for our international viewers, YouTube is the place for you. Thank you for your company and... Stay safe, everyone. Mm -hmm.